We can have hidden infections in chambers of the body, areas of the body that are hard to test and hard to find. I think chronic, chronic and hidden infections really complicate a lot of SIBO cases. Hey everyone, I spoke today with Dr. Allison Seebecker. This is her third or maybe fourth appearance on the show. She is just a wealth of knowledge. We talk about this really exciting new sulfur-based protocol for chronic bloating, distension, and constipation. We talk about SIBO of the nose, which may account for why some people have chronic digestive symptoms. If you also have chronic sinusitis, runny nose, congestion, we discuss fungus, SIBO testing, updates from the DDW conference all about digestive health. And then we go into what I am probably the most excited right now about anything, which is this connection between vector-borne microbes and chronic digestive symptoms and just chronic sort of non-responsive symptoms in general. Two clinicians, so this is chock full, I like to think, of clinical insights and um, I hope you will enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Dr. Allison Seebecker, welcome back to the show. It's always great to catch up with you. I'm so happy to be here with you again, Michael. Yeah, you know, we were catching up on the phone yesterday and I feel like that could have been a podcast really in and of itself. But let's try to recount some of the high points. And there's a few different threads, all I think equally exciting, and that have a fair amount of clinical utility for, because that's what it's all about, right? The person who is suffering, I don't know why I have food reactivity. I don't know why I have these chronic symptoms. I've tried some stuff. Maybe I've gotten a little bit of relief, but not long lasting or impartial. This is what the whole conversation is geared toward resolving. So within that, there's a number of threads. And, and the one that maybe we can start with is parasite testing. Because you and I both had done tandem, so two tests on the same person, stool test for a number of years. Uh, so we've looked at a couple thousand tests probably. If you do that for five-ish years, you might get up into the thousands in terms of tests that you've reviewed. And I think we should just remind people that both of our experience was similar in that it was very rare for two different tests on the same person to show the same results. So blasto and blasto or fungus and fungus, that was rare and more often they did not correlate with one another. It is so true that I, I never had ever the two tests correlate. What, what sometimes would happen is they might they might find one thing the same, but then one test would find something the other didn't. Um, but honestly, more often than not, they would find two totally different things. <laughs> sometimes one's positive, one's negative. Sometimes one thing's positive in, in one, one thing's positive in another, just all over the board. And and I was telling you that what what I decided to do with that is I decided to take it as positive that something that it wasn't a false positive, that something was really found. And Parasite testing, parasite tests it's, are notorious for having a hard time finding things, um, act, like, you know, actually finding what's there. And so I was like, well, look, if they found something, I'm going to go with it because they're symptoms. And so let's work on that. Uh, but it, it definitely, definitely, I believe those tests are, it's hard to find things. I mean, we were talking yesterday. It's like, even if you had one stool sample, you know, a part of that stool sample might have a parasite, something to show in it, while another part of that stool might not. So it's like, where are you getting the sample from? Right. And so this kind of leads into the other component that I, I wanted to discuss with you, which is, well, by one logic, it could be that the test that has the most positives is the best test. And I also think that's wrong, right? Because, and, and I'm not going to name the lab, uh, not yet anyway, but there's a lab that has recently come across my radar screen and a colleague of mine who I respect likes it. So we've been ordering this stool test for parasitology, but already the first three samples we've gotten have all had, all, all had cryptosporidium and giardia. And this isn't like within a family that maybe went backpacking and all had like the stomach flu. These are different people from different states, totally disconnected from one another. And to see cryptosporidium and giardia, three out of three, just out of the gate, I'm a little bit suspicious that these are false positives. And, and the reason why the false positive matters because 
there's likely the person listening to this or watching this saying, you know, I'm suffering and I want to have that thing to blame and to target. Get it, right? I think we're both on the same page, Allison, with, okay, whatever we can do to help you, let's do it. But if you end up treating the wrong thing, if you end up treating a false positive, you could spend a month or two or three just spinning your wheel. So that's the downside of, you know, the the best test is the test that produces the most positives, or, or at least in my opinion. Yeah, it's true. Uh, one of our colleagues who does, you know, I refer to her all the time for parasitology, you know, parasite treatment, parasite testing, also found the same thing. There was a certain lab, I think it's the same one <laughs> that you're talking about, that was just positive all the time on everybody. And she lost confidence in it. So if it, if something's always positive, you never see negatives, that's, that's a problem. You have to run a bunch to know. I, and I was telling you this too, that you know, I, I'm always asking our colleagues who do, you know, really focus on parasites, what test do you like, right? And I notice that they rotate through. It changes, right? Like they'll, well, I'm liking this one. No, now I'm not liking it anymore. Okay, now I'm, oh yeah, this one's going well. No, now I'm switching. I don't like that one. And they just constantly are rotating through because it is so, this this parasite testing is not, it's not as good as we would want it to be. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that's you know, when you had mentioned this on the phone yesterday, my reply was, ah, maybe what's happening here is someone switches over to a new test. They're excited about it because they start finding, you know, quote unquote, finding things. But with more weeks and months, they go, hmm, I seem to be finding a lot of the same thing or I never find nothing, right? And maybe there's a similar amount of parasites on someone who's generally healthy and just coming in for sort of a wellness checkup as someone with chronic, somewhat debilitating symptoms. So just right, like the, the picture here of this test, now that I'm getting to know it, doesn't really seem to suggest accuracy. And so then they jump to another test. And so I could see this being a cycle where over the course of two or three years, someone might go through three or four different labs, you know, being excited and then continually like falling into this cycle of, well, now that I've used it for a little while, it doesn't seem to be very accurate. Yes. And I don't know what everybody's reasoning is for that, but I just, I, I have to say, I see it so often. I've even seen colleagues, you know, naturopathic colleagues who were using different labs and then got frustrated and just went back to the standard like lab core O and P times three for a while, which, you know, almost never finds anything, you know, and it's, that's the level of frustration that people have with it, you know, so I don't, with the parasite testing, I don't know what, what to say or what to recommend. It's not, you know, it's not my specialty. It'd be interesting to hear what, you know, people who've gone through those cycles have to say, you know, and then another thought is, geez, if somebody has, you know, persistent chronic GI symptoms that we've tried treating other things, should we presumptively just treat for par parasites? There are, there are people that sort of just treat everybody presumptively for parasites. I don't know that that's the right answer, but one thing is clearly, you know, as practitioners, we're, we're all struggling to figure out the right test, the right way to do this. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, I guess there's no clear answer. And I think the most prudent approach is to really use a person's symptoms as the main barometer. In, in the area of stool parasitology, right, there's going to be exceptions. I think with thyroid, the lab, like I've said many a time, you know, the labs there are accurate enough to steer most of the process. You definitely want to personalize some of the approach based upon someone's symptoms, but the labs there tend to be accurate in discriminating hypothyroid versus normal. Here, I think someone's symptoms are going to be far more important. And this is a cool thing about natural medicines. We discussed on the show in the past, just as one example, looking at garlic for vaginal yeast infections was as powerful as fluconazole. So, you know, to go on a month long course of garlic, you could argue, hey, there's cardiovascular and circulatory benefits from the garlic, right? So it's not like we're using these really harsh, abrasive antibiotics and we have to have objective lab justification. So this is, again, one of the things I love about natural medicine is that we don't have to be squeamish about running an experiment. Yeah, that's true. So uh, one of the other things I wanted to come to, uh, a number of them uh, again, but there was this sulfur protocol that you had mentioned. I think it's a, a high dose MSM and helpful, if I'm remembering correctly from our conversation, for bloating, distension, constipation 
individuals, but would love to hear more about this. Yeah. So this, this was from um, Dr. Janelle and she uh, presented this at the gastro A&P conference in the fall of last year, 2023. So this is a wonderful gastroenterology conference for any practitioners listening. It's the Gastroenterology Association of Naturopathic Physicians, our annual conference. It's GI focused only. I love it. It's my favorite conference. Um, and so we we had her come. I'm, I'm on the planning committee, so I'm also quite biased. You know, I just, I love getting all these wonderful <laughs> speakers. You're going to be coming in to speak for us. So yeah, um, so, yeah, that's going to be great. So she gave this very fascinating lecture where she explained that she's been using this high dose MSM, high dose sulfur treatment for SIBO patients with a lot of success. Um, and you know, what would be the mechanism here? You don't know. It's a little, it's a little wishy washy in my mind. I'm not sure I care, but but the mechanisms put forward were that it's antimicrobial. Uh, it is for sure. And also that um, many people have a sulfur deficiency. Correcting that can correct many things. And one of the things sulfur does in the body is it's part of our structural bonds um, in our tissues. And so when we can when we can get those tissues strengthened, we might be able to affect motility and the migrating motor complex also, theoretically. Uh, and I mean, MSM is used for joint pain, right? That's right. As I understand it, yeah. So what but she does is... She she titrates people up from, you know, anywhere from a, a pinch to, you know, I don't know, like a half a teaspoon and then gets them up to the full dose, which is 30 grams, if I'm not mistaken. And I think it's about two tablespoons. Let me let me see if I, I just want to double check. So I'm not saying the wrong thing here. I'll, I'll get to it right here. And let me see here. Here it is. Yeah. 30 grams. Yep. Two tablespoons. And then you do that for uh, two months. And then step it back down to either being off of it or um, a maintenance dose of, of maybe around two and a half to five grams a day. Some people will need that ongoing. Others may not. She also does some other things. Um, she removes raw foods, cruciferous and allium vegetables and legumes uh, during that time. And she does warn that die off can occur because it is antimicrobial. So there are people that deal with that. And then she reintroduces the foods when she goes back down to the uh, to the you know maintenance dose. And as you said, she says it works best for the chronic constipated, chronic bloated type of patient who will feel better when they pass gas, that gas comes out, like they, they have, uh, you know, fermentative gas accumulation. That's what the bloating is from. And, you know, she just shared case after case of success, and we were all really excited about it. So um, my friend and, and colleague, and also you've had her on, Dr. Alana Gurevich, she started uh, doing it in in clinic with her patients, she really wanted to see how well this was work was working or would work. And she did it last I heard on about maybe thirty patients, and has had very good success. That it worked for most, but not all. And she she was focusing it on the chronic constipated, chronic bloating cases. She's now switching over to doing, trying it on diarrhea patients, um, SIBO patients, and we don't know how that's going to go yet. But basically, the bloating is coming down, and the bowel movements are occurring. So. For whatever reason, I don't know, but I'm so grateful to Dr. Janelle for sharing this interesting, different, new treatment. Yeah, this is really cool. And especially with it being validated by, to some extent, Gurevich, right? And in a population of people who are somewhat non-responsive, um, right? And that's that's actually one thing that I've tried to make a note about when I'm evaluating a new therapy, to be careful not to only reserve it for the non-responsive patients because that could give you a false perspective on it. And th this is the way I evaluated immunoglobulin therapy after coming across the study from Leonard Weinstock. And he used it successfully, 85-ish percent success rate in recalcitrant of no otherwise non-responsive patients, which is pretty impressive. It was non-blinded, non-placeboed, so it's probably about half as effective when you factor out the placebo effect. But nevertheless, in a otherwise non-responsive population, that's a pretty awesome finding. But what I did was I put it earlier sort of in our treatment hierarchy so I didn't select only for the people who are more challenging or less responsive. And the signal was clear. It's really cool to hear about Alana's uh, responsiveness with this. Uh, have you tinkered with it at all, Allison? Have you advised people on this? No, you know, I'm not in clinical not uh, clinical practice one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with one-on-one -on -one with patients anymore, so I don't have that opportunity. I do That's right. consult with small groups, but... Um, 
I, I was honestly, before I even started talking about it publicly or, you know, trying it, you know, recommending it to the, to the groups I consult with, I was waiting to hear Alana's results. Um, it's always nice to have, you know, yeah, I mean, just, why, why not? Right. Yeah. yeah. Not just if one someone's person. already kind of running the experiment, just yeah. let them get in the, Yeah. But I can tell you that I tried it on myself. Of course. Now that I had to do immediately <laughs> for those who don't know, I, <laughs> right. I, I have chronic SIBO. I've, I had it since I was five and it's very well managed. Um, but I, you know, it is chronic. So I do sometimes have relapses and things like that. And so I tried it on myself. And what I found was um, within just a, a day two or three or so, I wound up getting a headache that got progressively worse. That was you know, really, really, really bad. That is not a typical die off symptom for me, honestly. Uh, what I think it was, I actually, I didn't tell you this, Michael, is that I actually found um, just soon after that, I found that we had some black mold growing around the seal of our freezer in our basement. And I I wonder if it basically I was having an exposure, a mold exposure. And uh, it was it was put, because because sulfur pushes uh, phase two detoxification in the, in the sulfur detox pathway. So I wonder if it was just pushing too hard on that and well you know so i need to try it again because of course we got rid of that mold immediately around the seal of our freezer you know what must have happened is is that our freezer door must not have closed at one point and you know moisture accumulated so just saying was that there symptoms was, that you can correlate with with the freezer seal mold growth was there symptoms that you can correlate yeah, with that yeah so actually there concerned? was yeah. i was having much okay. worse histamine intolerance um, mm. I, yeah, so I, yeah, I do think so. And I was, I was, I actually got a sinus infection and a few other things. So I, I think so. Mm. So I have some other things I was just working on clearing up, which we might get to in my own health, but now I want to try it again. I was waiting to get those done. Cause I didn't want to, I like wanted to clear one thing and then I cannot wait to try it again for myself. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also seeing the rationale behind her starting at a lower dose and working upward. If it is something that helps with detox, then assuming people might just have some toxins that they can sort of purge. If you purge too quick, you might subject someone to die off that otherwise isn't really needed. So I, I, I kind of can see the rationale behind that. You know, I did want to say that she um, she did share cases where she didn't start super low there because there are people that aren't sensitive. You know, I mean, I, t I tended to always see sensitive, reactive patients and tough cases, but not everybody does. And so she said she started some people at 15 grams a day, like half dose, and they were OK with that. So, you know, not everybody mm. needs to start super low. I guess know your audience, so to speak, right? If it's someone with a history of being sensitive and reactive, start slowly. And otherwise, without that, you can probably just go into a full dose. So there's two threads here I want to pick up from. Uh, one is vector-borne microbes, but let's put that in the back burner and come over to the sinus infection because there was this interesting way that you phrased these pockets in the nasal cavity. I don't want to steal your thunder, but tell us about <laughs> this uh, this new clinical entity, if you will, and the approach that you're um, experimenting with. Well, I think I, to you, I called it SIBO of the nose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but basically, for, for so long now, I've been fascinated with, uh, you know, in, in medical, in the topic of medical mysteries, uh, chronic hidden infections. And I've, I've listened to some excellent colleagues discuss this and lecture on this. And I really think it's a very widespread problem where we can have hidden infections in chambers of the body, areas of the body that are hard to test and hard to find. So the sinuses would be one, and I want to explain that in a minute here. But other areas would be dental and like root canals, you know, that's not an easy thing. You can't stick a swab into somebody's root canal, you know, to test it, right? And, you know, vaginal, prostate, things like that. So I think chronic, chronic and hidden infections really complicate a lot of SIBO cases. And, you know, for for any, I don't know if you've, pro you will probably have my introduction, but I'm a SIBO specialist, which is why I keep talking about it, right? That's my field, right? So, and other things too. So, for myself, um, I I had suspected my husband had, I knew he had, honestly, I knew he had chronic sinus infections for years and years and years. And I was frustrated. What, you know, what happens with ongoing chronic infections is it'll come up to the surface and be like an acute infection at times, and then it'll go, go back down, but a person is still not functioning super well, right? And 
I, 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 I've swabbed his nose and everything and did, did all that, done all the treatments both orally, like internally, and nasal lavage, you know, antibacterials, etc. You know, I'm very well versed in all sorts of treatments for the nose now because of him. What I wanted was I wanted him to get a an image because I figured there was some sort of problem with the anatomy that was making it such that there was an obstruction where these infections couldn't drain. And that's why I refer to it as SIBO of the nose, because with SIBO, we sort of have two main physiologic in the body underlying causes of SIBO. One is deficient motility in the small intestine or the migrating motor complex. And the other would be partial obstruction. And there are a lot of cases like that that have some kind of partial obstruction. Adhesions are very common, other things. And so um, if there's something blocking, you know, the drainage of where the infection is, then how could it get out? So finally, I, through a colleague, found an EENT that all her patients had been going to, who's very naturopathically oriented, natural oriented. And first thing he wanted to do was do an image. Previously, anyone I sent him to, any ENT I sent him to, wouldn't want to do an image because that's sort of the way a lot of allopathic medicine is. They're not unfortunately geared towards really looking for underlying causes and trying to dig out and investigate. So we did the CT and right away you could see the infection clearly in various sinus chambers. So what what this what this guy does is he goes in and corrects the anatomy. So we did it on my husband and then I went to him. And I had been suffering from chronic sinus infections too, not nearly as bad as my husband and for not as long. But uh, yeah, he found the same thing. So for instance, there can be structures in the nose, uh, turbinates um, and deviated septums that can come into this that can actually push against the openings of the sinuses like a, like a door, a piece of tissue and flesh that's like a door that can be closed over these sinus openings. So there, then there's a room with a closed door and it has an infection in it. In it. How is it going to drain? And if you were to swab the nose, which of course we had done, you wouldn't be able to reach into there to find it. So, you you know, how can you actually test for it? You, you really might need an image to see which sinus it's in. And so the amazing thing was that he, he goes through this procedure where it's like a minor surgery procedure where he can correct deviated septum. He trims, um, trims swollen uh, inflamed turbinates so that they're a little bit more aerodynamic and not closing things off. He physically suctions out any infection he can see. Like when he moves tissues and now he, you know, cause I, I watched the whole thing. It was fascinating. You know, you could see the white coating of infection and he just vacuums it out, suctions it out. Right. And wow. does that he can reach. Of course there's, there's infection in sinuses that his instruments can't reach. And he does other things like that. And then another thing he does is something that you very well may be familiar with, which is kind of like the nasal specific that chiropractors and naturopaths do. So funny. I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> which yeah. is, you know, it's, but it's different. So what we do is, is it's like a balloon that we inflate in the nose. And um, really my understanding from my teacher who trained me on it is the purpose is actually to adjust the bones in the face. But at the same time, it does also open the tissue structures. Well, this is actually much more specific than a nasal specific because it's a little balloon that's like half the size of the tip of your pinky. And it simply goes into the openings of the sinuses, which is different. We, we're not doing that with our nasal specifics. So they're called the ostia. So it goes into the little ostia and just, you know, he inflates the balloon and the analogy is like, it's like a tin can. And you know how you would crush a tin can and it stays like that or an aluminum can. This is the same. So when you, when you open, it will stay now dilated or open, allowing for better drainage. So that is what the minor pr uh, surgery procedure is. And and you know what it's doing is just allowing infection to drain, I actually have a way out because we have those cilia that help, if they're still working, that help move things. So I can report to you, my husband is two months out now on his and it's been absolutely miraculous for him. His infection is gone. It takes some time to clear it. Um, and during that, during that process, you can feel like you have an infection because it's coming out, right? Um, but it, he, that's, that's gone. He breathes better. He can taste better. He barely snores at all. Really. He doesn't need his CPAP anymore because he needed all that. Cause he was all altered anatomy. Most amazing thing is he doesn't have knee pain anymore. So somehow that in inflammation, that, that chronic infection was causing body-wide inflammation 
which was affecting his knees. And now he has no knee pain, which is extraordinary. And he's also cut down on caffeine. He doesn't, he's not tired, right? He's not tired anymore because he well, doesn't he's have an better at night. Yeah, right? yeah, and yeah, and he doesn't have an infection. Those are two main drains to your. And your also, I forgot to say, yeah. he, his brain is. He says, "I feel like I have a new brain," which makes sense when you have an infection. <laughs> think, think about yeah. you know when if you're really sick, you know you, you all you want to do is lie down. And you can't think, right? And so yeah. he was performing. And they his call normal. they call it sickness behavior, right? When people have a low level infection, yep. sickness behavior, where they're they're just depressed and they're tired, almost like you have the flu, except you may not have all the respiratory symptoms, right? right in some <laughs> cases. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. So, so anyway, I encourage anyone, you know, who has chronic infections to try and find chronic sinus infections, to try and find a, a good ENT who can do this kind of a thing. Meanwhile, this uh, and who this was doc, sorry who was who was the the if you don't mind mentioning yeah. the name the the person that you guys worked with yeah so I'm in Portland Oregon so this is Dr Doug Scarada and he's at the Modern Nose Clinic I know he has an associate who does the same thing in uh, the Seattle area I don't know the name but you could always reach out to the Modern Nose Clinic and ask for referrals in your area <laughs> they're going to be inundated now but <laughs> but he you know what he does is quite special he was actually quite frustrated with the way surgeries are standardly done for the nose and, you know, wanted to branch out and do something different. And it's all done without, it's just done with um, local numbing and some calming sleepy meds. You know, you don't need just calm you down. And so that's good. But anyway, point being is uh, these, these chronic hidden infections really can take a toll on people. And Dr. Scarada believes that it could be related to SIBO, that we've seen this with dental infections. Uh, SSL has a numerous case. SSL is my colleague, Dr. S Stephen Sandberg-Lewis. Numerous cases of uh, dental infections and abscesses that once cleared, then somebody's SIBO and all basically all their digestive symptoms completely resolve. So uh, we'll have to see. I don't I don't have any cases to say for sure that's true with the sinuses, but you know we we were talking about there are there's um some um some like literature that talks about top down SIBO coming from the oral the oral pharyngeal. So it's yeah, a, it's well that was Richard Richard McCallum who was on the podcast. Uh, gosh, maybe. Five years ago now, I believe he's based in Australia. And yeah, and Bohm, found... doesn't Bohm work on this too? They, there's a whole subset in SIBO, yeah. like oral versus- Totally. Yeah. Yeah, like like top down versus bottom up. And I think they, they're they both probably right. Just depends on the individual. Yeah. But uh, that was, yeah, that was very insightful, McCallum's finding that there's definitely a subset for whom, whether it's the mouth or the nose or maybe both- and just this excess of bacteria. And I would also argue fungus based upon this one study we found that was fascinating. It was only in one person, but they did serial stool candida testing on this person over a number of weeks. And they had them oscillate for two days. You brush your teeth just once per day. And then for two days, you brush after every meal. This led to a 10 to a 100 fold difference in the level of candida in the stool. In which way? So the, the way. more brushing gave less? The more brushing decreased the amount of candida in the stool, which okay. totally maps on to this finding that there can be something uh, seeding, if you will, from the oral cavity or the nasopharyngeal cavity downward into the SI, the LI, and then, you know, out in the poop. <laughs> Absolutely. That's fascinating. Um, I remember Dr. Sam Rabar, who came and spoke at many of our SIBO conferences, um, he talked about this too. He had a strong feeling that the nose was a reservoir seeding, seeding into the small intestine and creating chronic SIBO. It's it's one of his, uh, you know, check this box. Do they have a chronic sinus infection if they have chronic SIBO? So, you know, we've been hearing about this for a while. We don't have proof, we don't have studies, but I'm really interested in pursuing this further. Yeah, same here. And, you know, there was one other study that we came across. It was a smaller study, it was from 2013, but it was in a group of people that had unresponsive, unidentified, in terms of the cause, gastrointestinal symptoms. And they found SIBO in about 20%, candida in about 20%, and both in about 20%. Oh, was this the Dr. Rao study? Uh, was I don't know if this was Rao. It, it may have been. Rao and Jacobs, um, maybe? Let me, let me pull it up. I have the abstract. Oh, you have it right there. <laughs> How fabulous. Yeah. 
I, if it's what I'm thinking, Jacobs is the is the first name. Oh, you're right. Rao, yeah, Rao, good on Rao you. The last, yeah. <laughs> yep. And Ra- I didn't yeah. know that was Rao, Rao and Co. Yeah, so I, I do think it. You know, it tells us that there's probably something. I mean, potentially, where from the top down, this, this might be happening, right? I don't think Rao found that per se, but just to show that when these imbalances occur, they may occur both with SIBO and with Candida. And and that might be a, you know, a, a way to get people thinking a little bit more broadly in terms of if someone has a positive SIBO test, they might only be doing SIBO, 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 and they never thought about, well, let me try a remedy that's antifungal because maybe they didn't have an antifungal test. But as I know you know, Allison, especially with fungus, the testing there is probably even less clear cut than a, it is less clear cut than a SIBO breath test. So just because you don't have a test positive doesn't mean we can rule out the possibility of fungal overgrowth. And this is where we'll look to symptoms. And I think symptoms are just so important in terms of, um, you know, do you notice that rice and potatoes and sugary fruits flare you? That's more demonstrative of candida. And it's and funny, like, that's the opposite. Honey, like honey and sugar. Because yeah. Like, like yep. table sugar is often well tolerated by SIBO only patients. But if they. I was have- going to say that. Yeah. Yep. So yes. like, it's like the opposite if yep. you're a classical IBS SIBO patient where you do the SIBO prep diet of rice and meat and you feel awesome. That may decimate a fungal patient. So these are the really important clues that if you listen closely, you can get a, a pretty good hypothesis on what it is in the microbiota that's driving some of these symptoms. It's so true. Yeah, and, and this is a key thing. Another thing is, is that when you do use the herbal antibiotics, so to speak, for SIBO, they're also all antifungal. So you can be hitting some of that fun, you know, fungal or candida overgrowth at the same time. However, I do want to say that clinically, I often found when people really did have candida along with SIBO, those typical SIBO antibiotics that are also antifungals, I didn't find them to be antifungal enough. Or somehow it's like they were they were preferentially going to hit the bacteria in the body. And so, and so what I'm talking about is berberine, allicin, oregano, neem. These are all antifungal, but what I found was I would have to add in things that were a little more focused on fungal, like uva ursi or paudiarco or caprylic acid or undocyclinic acid to really get the effect we needed. What have you seen, Michael? Yeah, it's funny because I'm starting to have that same suspicion. And this might be because of when candida goes chronic, it generates those little filaments, those hyphae that kind of anchor them into tissue. And some agents apparently have anti-hyphal activity. We've been discussing on the podcast in the past, and you and I on the phone yesterday discussed artemisia or, or artemisinin, either whole plant wormwood or isolate of wormwood. And these can actually sort of sever those hyphae. And there's some other compounds that can also do that. And this is where additionally, there may be a better case for antibiofilm. I was just thinking that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And these also tend to be people who have more die off. And I, you had said this years ago and I just filed it away. And it's funny how something like that will be in the back of your mind for, in this case, three plus years, you had said, I think fungal patients have more die off than SIBO patients. Definitely. And I'm starting to find that to be true. It's, it's worse. They have way worse style. Yeah. And I had come across a study one time, I never could find it again, that uh, talked about like- Don't you hate that? Like, yes. <laughs> it makes you feel like you're crazy. Yeah, yeah. But it was something like um, the immune system, like the candida has something like 176 antigens that like our immune system will recognize in, in comparison to say much less in bacteria, like a massive amount. It really flares the immune system. But I, I wonder if part of that is is because of those hyphae, right? Because they, they penetrate down into tissue and that's probably going to have more of an immunogenic response when you're sort of penetrating. Because the, the deeper you go to, to some extent, the more immune system activity you're going to you're gonna have as compared to being like in the distal lumen. There's still going to be immune activity there. Yeah. 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 And the antibiofilm thing, I had always found personally, clinically, that I really felt like antibiofilm was required when treating candida or, you know, yeast fungal. 
whereas it was not required when treating SIBO. Of course, you did the in-office study you presented at one of our SIBO conferences. Well, that's that's in peer review as we speak. And huh? gosh, we've been we've been sending the journal an email like every other week. Like, is it through peer review yet? Is it through peer review yet? And we so it's, I mean, you it's did that. just I think about. You presented that study in like 2015 at our one of our SIBO conferences. <laughs> it was years ago, <laughs> and then we, we just never got around. Yeah, we just never got around to publishing it because there's a whole layer of biostats and you you know it's a lot more work and back then we just didn't have the team of the resources to justify all that time but now that we have a team and we have help we can finally you know do a better job with publishing some of these things so i'm excited to get that paper out there this is very exciting i mean what i recall from it is that you did find statistically using antibiofilm actually brought down hydrogen gas a little better than not using it um, but that clinically there was not much of a, of a difference you could find. Is that, do I remember that correctly? Well, when we, when we, this is where the biostats are helpful. So when we went through the analysis with a biostatistician, we weren't able to demonstrate that the co-administration of the antibiofilm agents led to better resolution of SIBO. So, uh, there was still resolution, right? Both groups improved herbals plus biofilm, but the biofilm didn't seem to make the herbals work any better reinforcing what you've noticed. The thing that I'm still kicking myself about is we didn't do a quality of life measure or a symptom measure. We only looked at labs. So, you know, early in my career was just thinking about like the objective markers. If I were to do that study again, I would definitely have paired it with symptoms because who knows, maybe the biofilm plus group had better symptom resolution. We, you know, I couldn't see it. I couldn't either. I mean, we did... I felt that our experience lined up. Myself, my colleagues at our SIBO center at the time, we we treated people without biofilms and we treated people with and with SIBO. We could we could detect no difference, either in in anything in their in their resolution in how much gas came down in anything. Really, what we were the most interested for with antibiofilm and SIBO was relapse. That was where our key our keen interest was. Is you know because biofilm diseases are relapsing that, you know, obviously that's kind of what they do. If you, if you haven't gotten rid of all of it, it can come back. And so it's pretty much everyone's first thought, oh, is the reason that SIBO relapses so much due to biofilm. And we could not, we never were able to demonstrate that that significantly helped. However, what then happened was, this was many, many years ago, um, I had a conversation with Paul Anderson, who suggested trying the sulfur, the, um, sorry, the um, bismuth, the bismuthiol uh, antibiofilm remedies. And he had a, he has a compounded formula that he, you know, shares for free that anyone can compound. And also then he created a version that's over the counter. And um, I can say that, you know, I only had a, a, the chance to just test it a little bit before I stopped one-on-one -on -one clinical practice, but I did see better effects with that. So I, at least in SIBO, I would lean towards those um, you know, interesting, interestingly, I just saw, I know we're going to get to this later. Um, we just had the big gastroenterology conference called DDW, Digestive Disease Week. It just, it happens every spring and, it, you know, it's international and researchers work all year to present their work at that. And so that's where all the research comes out for the GI each year. And I, I just saw Pimentel's team had been experimenting with NAC. Um, you know, it's a classic antibiofilm for H. pylori. And I, and I wasn't able to review the study before we talked today because we had tried that extensively and we found it to be a complete dud clinically <laughs> for SIBO. But just and that, that was one of the agents we used in our in our study. We used you three, did. a, a multi-blend formula, NAC, and then uh, Cemento. Uh, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Separately. Yeah. But, you know, just coming back to the clinical thing, I would think say though that um any kind of antibiofilm i don't think it needs to be a bismuth one seems to help candida i believe in clinically yeah. so well so th this kind of comes over to this other area that i'm really excited about which is vector borne microbes this is borrelia or lyme or bartonella or babesia or ehrlichia rickettsia these organisms that we're probably all exposed to. Uh, they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Cats, flies, mosquitoes, ticks, lice, fleas, uh, all can vector these, right? And, you know, there's, there's one study that did find gastrointestinal symptoms were associated 
with having a vector-borne microbe. This is, I think it was, er, yeah, Michael Erdman. Um, are you familiar with Michael Erdman? Has he done any work at the gastro a &P? No. No. Okay. Uh, I know uh, Rashid, I'm blanking on his last name. Are you but, thinking of Dr. Uh, Dr. Rabar? Dr. Rabar? Rabar, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Dr. Rabar, I know he's found some association here. We're going to reach out to Erdman because his observational study was published just in 2021. But he found food intolerances, indigestion, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, and constipation correlated with you know, non-responsive or people who had those symptoms that were non-responsive correlated with the vector-borne microbe. And Marty Ross has discussed bloating, gas, constipation, loose stools, diarrhea, pain, cramping, also at least being associated with having these vector-borne microbes. And these are Interesting. infections that I believe really do require the use of antibiofilm agents. And this is a road that I'm currently on I came back positive for Bartonella and Babesia. And I can say that when I went on natokinase, lumbarokinase, and seropeptidase, I had two, three days of die off, just feeling really tired, a little bit of a headache. And how this maps on to digestive symptoms, my suspicion, and this borrows from something that the founder of ILADS, Joseph Berescano, had said. With these types of infections, you want to treat well past symptomatic resolution and you want to treat aggressively because they replicate very fast. A lot of these replicate within a day or so. And so if you let up too early, they start to grow back and you may allow the fostering of a resistant or a, a persisting colony. And this makes me wonder about SIBO patients with, with the relapsing, right? Because these bugs seem to be characteristically resistant if you don't fully treat them. And by full, again, and, and this is the opposite of what I found to be true in GI. With GI, you want to be minimal effective dose, at least mostly speaking. That's, that's what I've come to believe. You don't want to be overkill. But I think with these bugs, with these vector-borne microbes, you want to treat for a couple months past someone being fully resolved regarding their symptoms and you want to be aggressive. And the other thing that I think murkies this read without the right paradigm is die-off is so common that my suspicion is people are prematurely stopping therapy because they think it's a re, uh, an intolerance reaction. And this happened to me also when I went on high-dose garlic, I had two or three days of joint pain. Now, typically when I'd have joint pain from a treatment, I'd say, oh, you know, I'm nightshade intolerant, so this must be something similar to that, and it's just an immunogenic reaction. I shouldn't use it. But given this different paradigm I'm operating under now, I said, let me give it another day or two and see if you know, like the swollen, hot joints in my fingers get better. And what do you know? Two, three days in, completely resolved. So all this to say, I, I'm really becoming excited and curious to see if some of these quote unquote, chronic cases are because they weren't treated aggressively enough, long enough, and maybe people stop treatment too soon due to die off that they thought was a reaction. I just, I'm so fascinated with everything you said. I have a bunch of comments. I just wanted to pull out, um, because you mentioned this to me yesterday, and I had not ever heard that, uh, now which one was it? It wasn't Babesia, it was Borrelia, or the one that replicates within a day. So I actually went and did some checking on this after we spoke, yeah. and I was able to find at least in in vitro and in vivo data that most of these bugs seem to have a replication cycle of about a day. Wow! So it's all of all of the Lyme co-infections that I I think I mean I, I could be wrong. Incredible. It was a quick check, but it's so helpful to know that uh, it was brand new information for me, and it makes so much sense how you really have to make sure they're gone right and how quickly they can come back. How quickly they can come back, you know? Okay, so a few things I wanted to say is I thought those um, those studies you were pulling out about the association between um, SIBO and Lyme or vector-borne illness, they were highlighting diarrhea more so. And I think that's really interesting because um, Dr. Rabar had presented at one of our conferences an in-office study he did, and he associated it with super high methane constipation. 
And so Erdman, sorry, Erdman did find constipation. Oh, did. Ross mm -hmm. found constipation or loose stools, but Erdman, and I think Erdman's was a little bit more, um, the parameters of the study were a little bit more neat. So he's probably got a better read on this, but he had found constipation. So that, that seems to I mean, but it would be interesting if it could be both like that. To me, it could make sense that it could be either form, you know, uh, that SIBO expresses. But Dr. Rabar had pulled it out as like your super recalcitrant, you know, really high methane constipation SIBO cases. Like think about think about Lyme and co-infection. And then the other thing is, is that what we found for sure with SIBO, not general GI. Oh, and Allison, I don't want to, I'm so sorry to cut you off. Yeah, but yeah. This gets me thinking about... Because these vector-borne microbes are known to, in a lot of cases, impact the nervous system, I wonder if there's some sort of vagal, enteric, motility regulation that gets skewed. And you might see this along with something like muscle twitching, insomnia, right? Because there's just this nervous system involvement. That makes complete sense. Yeah. I mean, I remember one study showing, um, I think I have it linked on my website, that I can't remember. It was either, it was, might have been Babesia. Oh, I cannot remember. I'm sorry. One of the co-infections in particular was theorized to be able to stop the migrating motor complex. Mm. So, you know, that was one of the associations with SIBO. It's not so much large intestine, but, but um, I wanted to come back to the, um, the dosing. Specifically, what we found in SIBO is the higher dose you go, the better response we get. You know, we did a lot of dose finding with all our before and after testing, and uh, we kept increasing doses. And the more we increased them, the better response we would get. And there's even studies on uh, rifaximin, the main antibiotic for SIBO, uh, from Dr. Jolly, who talks about 2,400 milligrams a day. In fact, his study showed that if you start out at the standard dose, which is 1650, um, and although back then it might even be even been the 1200, but you started at the standard dose and they don't respond. If you just escalate the dose, they will usually respond. So we we sort of had found with SIBO in particular, like heroic dosing is what's needed. Like we usually mm -hmm. use five grams of berberine a day, which is like nine to 11 pills or more, depending upon how much is in each uh, capsule. And in fact, that's one of the biggest uh, reasons, I'd say one of the top three to four reasons we would see for treatment failure that was referred in to our specialty clinic is they just hadn't done the dose high enough. One of the, one of the problems with this is there was this wonderful herbal study many, many years ago um, on herbal antibiotics for SIBO. And we were so glad that came out. But what happens is a lot of times people will just look at that study and they'll, because it, because that study showed effectiveness, it showed it worked, right? And what they used was Metagenics, Candybactin AR and BR, or Biotics, efficidal, and dysbiocide. Two pills. Um, uh, it's basically like four, four pills, a, like four pills a day. Two pills twice a day of the two formulas at once. And the berberine, like candybactin BR, is just basically berberine with a few extra things in there. The dose is so so low compared to what we're used to giving. Now it works in the study. It worked, and it and it works. It works for some people for sure. Of course, I've seen those cases. But for many people, like really many, we had so many referrals where they would just come in and be like, "Well, I did the candy bactins and it didn't work." We would just bring the dose up to the proper berberine. You know, just give them the right amount of berberine, and you know, immediately they'd get better. So, I I think SIBO in particular is a situation where low dosing isn't so good. You know, you know, you get me thinking about two things. Uh, you know, one. The dosing that we're using, I think it's probably middle of the pack. Historically, we've used two antimicrobials at two to three capsules of each two to three times per day. So, you know, that's that's decently aggressive, I would say. So what's that? Two, four, six. That might be 12 or more capsules per day right? of total antimicrobial agents. I mean, it's going to vary in terms of the formula and the dosages therein, but just to give you sort of a ballpark. But perhaps the other thing that I've been missing is if we went too high with the dose, we would elicit a, a negative reaction that I was thinking was a true immune intolerance, but maybe it was die off. Right. And so maybe we found our way to a slower, steadier approach longer term, but the paradigm with vector-borne microbes, given your data, seems to also map on to SIBO. Yeah, it seems to. I mean, I know there's, people, yeah. uh, there's always exceptions to these patterns. Hey guys, just one update and afterthought I wanted to add here. I think Alice and I have both fallen into aggressive 
the ways in which we treat SIBO. She appears to be going higher with the antimicrobial dose. And I think what we are doing is, is different but similar in that we're using other therapies conjunctively. So we're combining a clinical dose of probiotics along with antimicrobials, elemental dieting, potentially immunoglobulins. And if you remember back, there's these two systematic reviews that found either rifaximin or probiotics separately each have about a 50% clearance rate of SIBO. If you use them together, the clearance rate goes to about 85%. So that's part of the rationale and thinking behind this. But nevertheless, I appreciate Allison's perspective, and we may even start going more aggressive with the SIBO antimicrobials within this context of multiple therapeutics, given that there seems to be multiple arrows kind of pointing in this direction. So in any case, just wanted to make that one follow-up and back to the interview with Allison. And then the last thing I wanted to mention about all those fascinating things you were saying about treating Lyme and co-infections is or maybe there'll be one more thing I want to say. It's this whole thing of treating past how long they have the infection. There's a couple, couple, couple things that come to my mind. I remember one of my teachers in medical school said, when you have like a cold or a flu, what you're supposed to do, you know, like basically a virus, right? What you're supposed to do is stay home resting for two full days after you feel well enough to go back to work. Like what person does that like no one right right, right. but this yeah. is like this is like <laughs> old time like naturopath and he's like because if you don't you're likely to get a secondary bacterial infection or get it again or just like weaken your immune system and it's it's just it's just really interesting it's it's not the exact same thing right but it just just reminds me of that principle of like going past when you think you're better you know right it's just a really yeah, interesting this, thought. This makes complete sense. I mean, this, this is, a, I think, a really important paradigm shift, which is, you know, be more aggressive rather than less aggressive. And, you know, it's funny. I would think that the population that needs this the most might be the one that is sometimes shied away from this the most, which is those with a history of reactivity. Because some of that reactivity, I've got to think, given my own experience, and actually, it's funny, Dr. Scott from our clinic is his case is very similar to mine. And so we're constantly just comparing our own self-treatment notes. And he had the same thing with what he thought previously was was a, an intolerance reaction. And he pushed through it and it went away a few days later. But it was certain symptoms, mainly joint pain, that he thought, well, this means it's an intolerance. He had always made that false equivocation. Um, yeah, I mean, so it, it, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, the other thing this gets me thinking about, there was a paper that found the rifamycins, which includes rifaximin, have antibartonella and antibarrelia activity. Now, rifaximin is poorly absorbed, but maybe even that poor absorption is enough to have an impact. And it makes me wonder, well, maybe the, t- you know, the two weeks is just insufficient to totally get a vector-borne microbe. If it is, or I guess SIBO, maybe people just need more aggressive, longer-term treatment to really get over the hump. And this is where I think the the natural agents have a lot of attractiveness because the side effect profile, if you're too aggressive with antibiotics, leading to like a secondary fungal overgrowth, may not be as high with herbals. That's just speculation. There's not any studies that I know of that are looking at that, but because the herbals often are going to be both antibacterial and antifungal, you may not just hammer down bacteria and allow fungus to go, yay, like time for us to come out and sort of run amok. Yeah, I'm loving all these thoughts. Th- this discussion made me think of one other thing, though, that I do want to mention, which is that this isn't about treating Lyme, but treating SIBO. Another pattern we've seen is that, because this is about how long to treat for, this was really common in in our, in, you know, our specialty clinic, maybe not so common for those out in general practice who aren't seeing the, like the failures, but we would see that if you keep treating with whatever agent you're using, it basically it's, it stops working. It's like the effect peters out. And what, what would happen is people would begin relapsing. Their symptoms would begin coming back. The original symptoms while they're actually still on the treatment medicine, whether it's herbal or pharmaceutical. And so, you know, there are a lot of people in, in, you know, common in practice who will 
uh, put people on things for three months. And I don't tend to do that. Now, that's like kind of what we're talking about, doing longer for Lyme. But for SIBO, I wouldn't do that because we're still in the middle of trying to get it eradicated. And it, it just, the effect peters out and we would have to stop it and then switch to something else. So, and I don't know that it's straight up actual antibiotic resistance or if it's just like clinical intolerance. I don't know what it is, you know, but basically tachyphylaxis. And so for pharmaceutical antibiotics, we didn't tend to go past about three weeks. And for herbals, we didn't go past about six weeks. Sometimes we would go to eight weeks, but we, we usually do four to six weeks. Reason being is just, just in the population that I was seeing over and over and over, the pattern would be that their symptoms would return while still on it. And then if we would just stop and switch to, you know, a different agent, we would get effect again. I do want yeah, to say well, that I just have to say there's of course exceptions to this. And I've absolutely seen patients who, you know, were on like, I mean, I had a patient who came to me because berberine was still working after two years. It was the only thing she could do. And if she stopped it, she would immediately get so. So of course I've seen the exceptions. To this. And I've seen people who were on put on Rifaximin for five months and it totally worked or whatever. So I just you know, that has to be said before people yeah. freak out. You know, I've been just talking about a pattern here. So go ahead. Well, you know, this pattern, it's funny, it seems to map on a lot to what I'm coming to find with Lyme in that you hear some people recommend that you're going to get some improvement from a given herb or, or treatment, and then it's going to plateau. And so that's when you layer another one on top of that. And it's sort of this, you know, successive, you, you build and build and build where you might have someone on three or four different agents and then you treat two or three months past full symptomatic resolution before you start taking some of these things away. I see. So you don't stop one and move to another. You keep the original and add in. Yeah, at least that's one of the theories that's been proposed is, is you kind of stack these because you want to keep that's the pressure right. from the one on the microbes and then add another one that's going to hit what would theoretically be a population that's somewhat resistant to the first agent, say berberine. So now you add in high dose oregano and maybe that gets you another 30%. And then you add in high dose garlic and you sort of stepped your way up this, this, this ladder, so to speak. This is a fascinating approach that I have never tried with SIBO. Yeah, and it's funny. I think a lot of the SIBO and Lyme probably follow the same trajectory. And it gets me thinking about one other thing, which is therapies we can use to strengthen the immune system. So this is where in a lot of the Lyme community, you'll see things like ashwagandha, ginsengs, and eleuthero as kind of immune tonics, or hyperbaric oxygen, or even ozone. And we had someone on the podcast about uh, talking about ozone maybe five years ago. And my intuition went off in a bad way because there didn't seem to be any entertainment of ozone not working. It was kind of one of those people that it's like, everything's positive. And if, if someone never says anything like, well, I'm not sure if it helps these cases, or I'm still trying to make my mind up about X. If I never hear something that's self-doubting, I get really suspicious. So come now. Um, yeah. And by the way, I've been I, looking mean, I just have to say that like, please. you know, anyone who's been in practice for a long time, who's seen difficult cases, like, you know, we, we doubt ourselves. Like it's tough. We do. You with have, yeah, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there has to be that 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 doubt keeps you honest. It, it keeps you sort of looking for and weeding out weaknesses in your argument. Yeah, your, I mean, because you know, like you can get you can get kind of it's a tough profession. Nail. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Keep going. Totally. But so I've I've been looking into ozone, and one of my colleagues he mentioned rectal ozone, and my instinct was, okay, come on, like the amount of absorption has to be viable or, or inviable. I don't think it's, it's probably one of these, like people do it and it's all placebo effect, but there's at least two studies with COVID longer COVID finding improvements in multiple markers, whether it's O2 saturation, energy levels, they didn't find any difference in mortality, but many of the morbidity markers how you feel and inflammatory markers improved. There is another study, I believe it was in Ebola using rectal ozone, also beneficial. What's cool about this is you can do this at home. There's this great company called Simply O3. And all you need to do is buy, it's like the size of a tissue box, an ozonator, 
an oxygen tank and you can fill up a little bag with ozone and you can do on your own rectal ozone. Now, you know, it seems a little bit weird, seems a little bit weird to me to do any sort of rectal therapy, but um, looking at some of these results and for it's maybe twelve, thirteen hundred dollars to get this set up, but then you have it forever. For those who seem to be somewhat immunocompromised, they just have a, a weak immune system. This is another like layer along with some of the herbal immune adaptogens that I think may help with these people that just seem to need so much killing. Right. You know, I I myself had not been, you know, doubting of ozone. I had always thought very well of it. Uh, you know, I didn't talk to someone who said it helps everything <laughs> all the time without fail. So I, I didn't I didn't have any reason to suspect it, but. I've heard such good things about rectal ozone. I've tried it myself during a, a killing regimen, and I thought it was helpful, um, you know, easy to do. I didn't have a home set up, and I've been hearing about how to get it, you know, in your home. So, because I had to go to a friend's clinic and who would make it for me, you know, and then you got to rush right. back and use it right, right away or whatever, you know. Um, yeah. So, I think that's really a great idea. I feel very positively about ozone and also hyperbaric oxygen. I've heard such good things about that you know, for long COVID, for Lyme, for mold. And and just before we finally leave that Lyme, Lyme discussion, the, the last thing that needs to be said is, you know, in in difficult, tough cases, particularly of, of SIBO, Lyme should be considered. I mean, if, if nobody took that out of this discussion, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And, and I, I'm excited about this because my suspicion is there's a cohort that has, up until now, flown underneath our radar. And it's those cases where, you know, you zig and zag and you come at all the different angles from the gut and you get some improvement, but you never really get over the hump. And that's the, the cases that I'm thinking about. And, and especially if you have a decent assortment of non-GI symptoms, there's going to be some GI symptoms like we discussed, right? But if there's insomnia, if there's fatigue for no other known reason, right? If you're doing everything right and you're just having sleepless nights or fatigue for no known reason that just sort of like waxes and wanes, joint pain, especially joint or muscle pain that tends to be migratory. It's my low back and then it's my shoulder and then it's my neck. Um, yeah. So I agree with you. Hot I'm flashes. really excited about you this. The hot, hot flashes, Babesia. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah. And, and Lyme is like, like candida overgrowth, uh, hard to test for. I mean, there are tests, but then there's this difficult interpretation. And I mean, you know, I haven't even gotten And it's it expensive. All. Very. <laughs> I went through a round of testing myself and it was $4,000. Wow. And there was even a, okay, I think we've got most of the picture, but there could still be Borrelia. And maybe we do this other test that assesses other species of Borrelia. So you can drop a lot of money and um, I'm just not sure how essential it is, especially when I'm thinking about, okay, let's do Artemisia at a clinical dose. Do you have die off? And that gives us amazing verification that at least some of these organisms are there. And something that Tanya Dempsey said to me recently was she almost never, never sees Borrelia or Lyme alone. It's almost always with other organisms. So if the big three are Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia, and there's at least going to be two of these in all cases, does the testing give you that much information that you really need? Now, if you're doing antibiotics, I see from like a med legal perspective, okay, you need some justification in case you ever get called to, to, you know, to question on this. And for some therapies like SOT therapy, which is very, so that's specific oligonucleotide, it, it, it targets the microbe itself. Maybe you need to do testing before you do that therapy. But I think for almost all of these other therapies, you can just pair them with the individual and personalize them based upon their response. Okay, so let's go to DDW and, and some of the, the pearls that you've taken from this recent conference. Okay, I've just started going through all of the new information and abstracts, so I've only pulled out a few to talk about. There's there's so many that I, I have yet to read, because <laughs> it just happened like a week and a half ago, a week ago. Um, but 
this one that was really interesting I wanted to highlight was only given as a live lecture. So there, it's not even a poster or an abstract that you can pull out. And it was um, some new information about hydrogen sulfide SIBO. You know, obviously my main interest is going to be first looking at all the SIBO stuff and then all the rest of the GI stuff. So um, this is Dr. Pimentel's team, who, if you don't know, Dr. Mark Pimentel is a lead researcher in SIBO internationally, works at Cedar sinai and has a research center. And they've, they've been doing fascinating work for years. They've um, they validated and, and figured out and validated a way to sample the small intestine. This is a very hard place to sample with an endoscope. There's a lot of contamination issues and just getting enough sample and getting the instrument where it needs to go. So they, they spent years working on that, validating that. And now they've been doing all these basically microbiome studies, um, sampling the small intestine, which had not been done yet. All of our microbiome information was on the stool and large intestine. And so they've been trying to map you know, what is going on in the small intestine. It's been fascinating. Like every year they have new stuff. So this year, what's new is we have that information for um, hydrogen sulfide and also methane in the small intestine. But for hydrogen sulfide, even just as recently as I think December, they had gotten us some new information on what organisms are overgrown in hydrogen sulfide SIBO. And why I like this, what they're doing is because if we can figure out exactly what's overgrown, like as per our discussion, we can target it better with our treatments. You know, what herbs and what pharmaceuticals might get it better so we don't have to be, you know, rummaging around in the dark here. And so what had been known so far was some of the overgrown bacteria in the large intestine. Hydrogen sulfide and methane overgrowth can occur in both the small and large intestine. You know, we kind of think of it as SIBO, but it but methane now has its own new name, intestinal methanogen overgrowth. Intestinal because it can be small or large. So back to hydrogen sulfide, in the large intestine, we know it's Fusobacterium varium and disulf disulfibrio piger. But additionally, they had this new information um, from December that the Fusobacterium varium can lead to lactnospiraceae and bilophilia overgrowth. And the disulfovibrio piger can lead to Sotorella overgrowth. That's in the large intestine. What's new now, just came out, you know, a week and a half ago, is in the small intestine, they found three main overgrown bacteria for that produce hydrogen sulfide, Proteus mirabilis, Disulfosarcina widelli, and Disulfobulbus ol oligotrophicus. Hard, hard mouthfuls there. Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got it out. <laughs> so, oh, pardon my alarm here. So those are the new ones for the small intestine. And they actually found a whole bunch of other um, overgrown you know, it's not just, you know, one or two things. It's a, There was a bunch of things, but those were the ones that correlated the best with breath testing. So the other thing mm -hmm. that was kind of special about this is that in the last two and a half-ish, uh, you know, three years, there's been a direct test out now for um, hydrogen sulfide in the breath. Um, and this is the TRIO SMART test. This was created and validated by Dr. Pimento. And, um, you know, it's it's still pretty new, but what they've done here in their newest studies is they've used the Trio Smart instead of using what always had been used is you know the Quintron machine is breath test machine is what's used in pretty much every study. So in these studies they're right. using the Trio Smart because it tests for hydrogen sulfide. It's the only one that does, and so they correlated these particular bacteria with the hydrogen sulfide. So I thought that was also very interesting. And they also pulled out which pathways, which like sulfur pathways are active, um, which, you know, gets kind of in the weeds, but it's, it, it is, it is really interesting. So that, that's the main thing that came out of one of these studies and they had 109 study subjects. So pretty decent size. What are your, just in, in brief here without, cause this could be a podcast in and of itself, but, um, there was some suspicion that, that I also shared that there was false negatives on the TRIO Smart breath test. Yeah, has anything there been corrected, rectified, updated? Well, you know, we, we sort of went through a whole bunch of stuff clinically when we when it first came out. I, I, myself and a colleague formed a hydrogen study sulfide group, um, hydrogen sulfide study group to, to figure out what we thought about this test and, and what treatments were working when we used the test. And at first we thought it seemed like everybody was positive, you know, and that seemed wrong, like we were talking about earlier. And then it, then it seemed like now no one's positive. <laughs> and, you know, so we go back and forth, but it kind of depends on who you talk to. Um, that might 
sort of be what a lot of a lot of folks are feeling. But then I've talked to other practitioners who say, no, I'm getting I'm getting positives. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure what to think yet. The the general confidence from all the people I speak to is mixed. Some people like it, others don't. But that's always going to be the way with any anything new. Right. We really have to kind of work with it a while till we till we understand it. Um, I think what the main concern was that I'd heard is is that there could be false negatives or simply low or underreporting of methane. That's what a lot of clinicians felt they were seeing is um, hydrogen seemed accurate. We have no way to know about hydrogen sulfide, nothing to compare it to, but methane might have been too low. I mean, we can say in the validation studies, it it paired up well. I mean, it, it was validated, but uh, clinically, there's a, a bit of a suspicion of that. I don't know what to think. I don't think I've run enough of them to really know. Okay. Yeah. All right. so, coming, coming back to DDW, to DDW, what else is exciting? So they've also correlated, um, they keep correlating these different bacteria with particular symptoms, which is really, really interesting. I don't think they've fully done that for those ones they, they just had, um, but they've done it for a lot of other ones. Now for the methane, they've analyzed quite a bit more in the small intestine. We know that methanobrevibacter smithii or M. smithii is the main methanogen in both the small and large intestine. I think it's like, you know, above 60% in, in each case. But they now figured out in the small intestine, there's a couple of other methanogens that are also there contributing to the situation. And that is methanosphera stadmane and methano, let's see if I can get this one right, methano methanomacillococcus luminensis. So those are some new methanogens that we had not really known about. And in both of these cases, the more of these uh, methane or hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria that are present, and usually if there's like three or more, the the more it correlates with the severity of the of the gas on the breath test and the symptoms. So you know they're correlating it, you know, with everything they need to there. So what I'm hoping is that there will be some studies coming out, hopefully not too long from now, showing what treatment agents are effective against all of these things. I, I would imagine those are already in the works, um, but we don't sure. have them coming out yet. And something else I just wanted to mention is they did bring out a new term. So a couple of years ago, we got the new term in, intestinal methanogen overgrowth or EMO. Now they've brought out a new term in this new uh, oral presentation they just gave for hydrogen sulfide, intestinal sulfide overproduction or ESO, I-S-O. And actually, I don't mind it because one of the things that um, would happen to me all the time is, you know, studious practitioners would would write to me or and say things like or talk to me and say, I just came across this article that shows that hydrogen sulfide is good. Like, so does that mean hydrogen sulfide's, you know, SIBO is bonk? Like, and get all confused. And so the situation is that hydrogen sulfide is made by humans as well as bacteria. And it's very beneficial in the normal amount, right? In the normal physiologic amount, it's a, a repairing substance and it's good. But when it's in overproduction or in excess, it's actually toxic. It's toxic to mitochondria. You're nodding your head so you know all this, but it really confuses a lot of, a lot of people. So I like that they're using the word overproduction to make it clear here. It's like, it's, you know, so that people understand there's a difference in, in amounts. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's really easy to sort of dichotomize things, but oftentimes, like I've said on the show in the past, we come back to the Goldilocks zone or the, the, the optimal balance in, in biology. Yeah. And then again, that's really important because sometimes what will happen is people will, will fixate on something or they will overly pathologize sulfur and maybe they don't eat any sulfur in their diet, right? It's like, well, sulfur, I'm on this like crusade against sulfur. And, you know, all of a sudden they go on this crazy diet. And yeah, I think that is really important to to denote. So we have uh, SIBO, EMO, and ESO. Okay. Yeah, apparently, cool. right? And also for anyone who didn't know, we got ICD-10 codes for all of the all of the SIBO and CIFO diagnoses. That came in October last year. Um, and that that's been wonderful, you know, because there are there is still controversy with um SIBO. There are still practitioners who don't recognize it or believe it's a real thing. But the, you know, ICD-10 means the World Health Organization and you know, and the AMA has recognized it. So um we have, you know, the overarching categories intestinal microbial overgrowth, which actually would be IMO, but just 
and then we have the SIBO, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. We've got CIFO, and then we have EMO uh, for ICD-10s. So that's also good to know. That's kind of an update from a half a year ago. So I think those are the main, um, let me just see if there was anything else I wanted to pull out. Um, one other thing that I thought was nice is there's um, there's a new study on elemental diet. You know, you and I are both fans of this. It's a traditional treatment for SIBO. And we really have one main study on it for SIBO that Dr. Pimentel had done many years ago. Um, I think it might've been even like 2006. I'm not sure, a long time ago. There was actually a case study published of, for my homemade elemental diet. But other than that, I don't think there's really any main. Oh, very main, cool. Yeah. So there's a new one now. And I'm so glad to see it because, you know, it's it's always good to have more studies on this. And um, it was a an N of 30, so 30, 30 participants. And they, they did two week of elemental diet. But what was really nice about this one was they actually were looking for methane as well. So for methane, SIBO or EMO. And what they were able to find is um, the different rates of success for, for the different types. They found that it was about a 50, so in a two week course, it was about 58% successful at normalizing the breath test in uh, EMO or methane. 100% for the hydrogen, for regular old SIBO, and 75% normalization for those who had both hydrogen and methane, so mixed mixed SIBO, um, hydrogen and methane. And, you know, what the situation is here is many people have very high levels of gas, and two weeks is not going to be long enough. And the original protocol, um, you can go to three weeks. Some people even go further. And so on that, on that note, they did um, make a note that even if breath tested and normalized, gas came down significantly, very similar actually for both methane and hydrogen, um, dropped anywhere from 12 to 43 parts per million, even in those who did not um, normalize. And that would just mean they would need longer or another round of something else after they finished it. That's always been one of the problems with um, studies talking about normalization of tests for SIBO is they're just usually doing one round of treatment and they're not taking into account we often need multiple rounds. And so then the stats can look, oh, well, it didn't normalize. It didn't eradicate it. It's like, yeah, but it did great. And if you just done the next round, you'd get it there. So I was very pleased to see this. Now we have some data for uh, methane as well as hydrogen and mixed on elements. That's very cool. And, you know, we, um, we have everything ready to go for a waitlist controlled trial where we're going to study the hybrid use of the elemental diet where people will do a reset for anywhere from one to four days, just how we use it in the clinic, followed by half and half, half your calories for two to three weeks and then reassess. And I'm so curious to see what we can document because gosh, this is so much easier for people to do. To, to, uh, to do. And also in the inflammatory bowel disease literature, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, this hybrid approach has been shown to work really well. We tabled the study for a little while just because we had a lot going on, but I'm hoping that we can maybe launch this maybe early next year because um, I'm, I'm just so eager to get a study out there that can document this easier to use protocol because as I'm sure you hear, you mentioned the elemental diet and people who are well read on it go, Oh, man, like I, you know, I thought you might say that, but I was hoping you wouldn't because two weeks on no food seems so daunting. And I don't think it, my experience has not shown that we have to, I mean, it's going to work, right? But I don't think we have to go that uh, strict and that, uh, that intense to get over the finish Michael, line. explain what your hybrid approach is so people know. Yeah, it's just essentially half your calories in a day from the elemental. And so you don't so specify maybe, what the food should or shouldn't be in the other half of the day. Uh, yeah, that's one thing that we've thought about in terms of do we have people go on the low FODMAP diet or not, you know, when they are eating food. What we were going to do, if I'm remembering all the details correctly, is keep people on the diet they were at at baseline. It just because we were trying to make a study that would map on to clinical practice as best we could. So some people might come in on low FODMAP some people might come in on gluten dairy free. Some people might come in on like a plant based diet. But whatever they've noticed works well for them, we're going to keep that consistent because we didn't want to confound, right? If you have people go from a baseline diet all to low FODMAP plus elemental, that's going to undercut the potential utility of the elemental. I think this sounds not perfect, but it's hard. It's hard to have a perfect setup. Absolutely fascinating, and you're going to do it for multiple conditions, right? Like SIBO, IBD, various things. 
we're going to focus on IBS and SIBO. Um, you know, part of it does depend on how much we can fund because this is all self-funded. So we're trying to get a sample size of 70, but uh, we'll see. And we'll and I'll probably ping you ahead of time so you can share with your audience when we're going to recruit. Absolutely. But um, yeah, we're, we're working on it. This is going to be awesome. Thank you for any study that you do. I'm always so grateful for everything you look at, you know, in office. It, I, it's hard and costs money. So thanks. Well, yeah, it's uh, it is hard, um, <laughs> and you know we've we've made some mistakes, but I think we've gotten most of the mistakes out of the way. Like in in this study, we're going to be issuing an IBS symptom severity score plus a Promise Ten, so we can qualify and quantify how they feel. Because let's say there's only a minimal change in the gas levels, but people have a notable improvement in their IBS symptoms and their quality of life. Well then that's up to people to interpret how they will. But for me as a clinician, that would be a win, right? If people are seeing nice symptomatic mm -hmm. resolution and their their ADLs, their activities of daily living are less interfered with, then yeah, I'll take that all day. Absolutely. So Allison, um, we could talk for another hour per the usual, but uh, where would you want to point people? I know you have a wonderful website full of resources. Where would you point people? What are you working on? What do you want to share with us? Yeah, my website is SIBOinfo.com. And um, I would encourage people to sign up for my newsletter. That's how I, I let people know of anything that's going on. You could do that on the homepage, the welcome page, and um, my, you know, my email list. For instance, I'll be sharing all of the um, studies from DDW and what they what they have to say in my upcoming, you know, emails and newsletters. I just shared two or three here and there's like 50. <laughs> so so yeah, that was a great amazing. resource. And um, of course, I always have for anyone who would like to learn more about SIBO, I have several courses. I have a, a comprehensive training course on SIBO. It's called the SIBO Pro Course. It actually has 20 CMEs for anyone who can use that. And I created two mini courses as well, because I know not everyone wants to do a 22 hour course, right? It comprehensive. <laughs> so I just have a couple of three hour courses, get in, get out. And I also have even shorter master classes. So you can find all of that on my website. And Michael, you probably have the links for some of those as well. Yes, we'll include all of that. Well, Allison, it is always, always great catching up with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, so good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>